Today we're going to be looking at 1 Timothy 1, and we're going to be looking at uh, the books of 1 and 2 Timothy for the next while until we get to uh, Lent with Ash Wednesday in the middle of February. Just like uh, personally, it's always a good thing to take a book of the Bible and read it slow, and we're going to, that's what we're going to be doing in worship, taking a book of the Bible and just doing one chapter at a time. And so if you want to read ahead, next week we'll be doing 1 Timothy 2. So that, that's where we're going. We're going to start with looking over the first chapter, make sure we have a sense of it, and then see what happens. So the first chapter begins. We have this very formal greeting on behalf of Paul. Paul, writing with a more formal style than anywhere else in his letters, writes to uh, Timothy, he says, From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and Christ Jesus our hope. And then he writes of Timothy. He doesn't say, hey, Timothy. He says, Timothy, my loyal child in the faith. Then he gives directions to Timothy. I want you to keep on teaching at Ephesus. That's to be your task. Keep on teaching. As some people have gotten a little bit excited, a little bit off the rails here. They've been tempted by novelty, and they need to be brought back kind of in line on the straight and narrow. Keep on teaching the law as we rightly understand it in its proper context, being something to help people understand what is right and wrong until they understand to follow Jesus. For you and I both know, Timothy, the law is a good thing, not forgetting that it's only by the grace and forgiveness of God that I, Paul, am able to say this because we all know my history, my own baggage that was not held against me. Thank God. I am thus the example of what can happen with folk, as, and as you are doing in your life, and let's keep on doing these good works, because we'd hate to have another of those situations happen. You know, that situation with Hymenaeus and Alexander. Ugh. Right? So there's the first chapter. You ever read a chapter of the Bible and uh, say, okay, that was good, and that's about it, All right? I say it's good to take a book and read it slowly. It's not just good for like anyone. It's really good for me. Because I, I've committed, I'm going to preach every book of the Bible before I retire, and it's time for me to do Timothy. And I, I read 1 Timothy 1. And I thought, okay, that's nice. What am I going to talk about? Right? I, for, until about Thursday at midday, I had two minutes of sermon. That was it. And then I went out, and, and I had read and studied. I'd spent two days just reading all about this, and I had, like, nothing. I figured I had two minutes of sermon, and I was going to say, okay, next time, here we go. And um, I was out shoveling the snow out here, and, and just got to the point where I had to just, like, sit down with my set while I was shoveling. And just, okay, who is in this? Who has a dog in this fight? Who cares about what's happening here? And, and with that in mind, I started to realize, well, okay, let, that's what makes sense of this. Let, let's look at who has a dog in this. Who, who cares about what's happening here? And, and we'll start to understand. Uh, when we say this is the word of God for us, the people of God, yes, there really is something here for us, even if at least it took me a few days to figure it out. So we have four people in this sort of situation. We have Timothy. We have the people who have gotten a little bit excited and kind of gotten off the rails. We have Paul. And we have those two who got really stubborn and caused a stink. We're going to start with Timothy. Paul writes to Timothy, and they know each other. They know each other well. They have traveled together. And like, if you and I were to go travel together... Like, you'd spend a few hours on an airplane or driving to Columbia or something like that. You'd, you'd chat a little bit, and that'd, that'd be nice. you get to know each other. That's not quite how they traveled. When they traveled, they spent months together walking. Like, they walked, they would get up in the morning, and they'd have, like, all day just to walk. And all you can do while you're walking is talk. And so, at this point where Paul is writing to Timothy... They have talked about every single thing they could possibly talk about. They've eaten together. They know what each other likes to eat. They know which one likes to skip breakfast. They know which one snores and so which one should fall asleep first. Like, they've met. They know each other really well. And so it is a little bit interesting that Paul doesn't start out by saying, Hey, Tim. Right? He writes in this very formal fashion with his full title, right? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. 
And he writes not, hey, Tim, he writes to Timothy, my loyal child in the faith. Why would he do that? You ever have a discussion, not, what comes to mind is a discussion with your parents where your dad says, son, we need to talk. He could have said, hey, Andy, get in here, but it's son, which is a reminder, like, father, son, it is time for us to have a father and son discussion. You've probably had permutations of that. Daughter, it's time. It might involve your middle name as well. Like, it, this is a pretty, this is a discussion that need, is reinforced the, reinforcing the power dynamic. I'm about to tell you something, Timothy, and you need to be paying attention real close. And then he tells him, I need you to stay in Ephesus. Okay, Paul writes a letter in response. Like every time Paul writes, he's writing in response to something. He doesn't just dash off letters, with one exception, the letter of Romans, which is a different beast. But all the rest of them, Paul is writing in response. And so what is the question that Timothy would have asked such that Paul would write back, I need you to stay there? All right? What's the question? The question, is, as far as I can tell, would be something like, can I go now? Right? You think about, Timothy has been traveling with Paul a lot. Timothy is a younger man. He's gotten used to going out and traveling and seeing the world and being with Paul and going to new cities and going to new places. And now, Paul has said, I need you to stay in Ephesus while I go on to Macedonia. And, and Timothy has written to Paul and said, can I come to you now? Can I go have fun again? Like, this is getting a little bit, you know, I want to hit the road. Right? That's, that's what I, that is the question that would lead to this answer. And so Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, you know, you need to stick with it. It's not time to get up and go. You need to stay put. You need to buckle down. There's work to be done there in Ephesus. Son, it's time to get to work. Right? I don't think Timothy was excited to get this letter because he wanted to get up and go. Right? And so this, Paul is telling him to buckle down. That's the formality of the, the Paul. I'm, I'm Paul. Remember who I am. Come on, my child in the faith. Son, come on. Let, let's, I need you to sit down and learn a skill that I, Paul, had to learn. If you think about Paul, Paul traveled for years on end. He would spend months traveling, and then he would get somewhere, and he'd start a church. And he would either stay at the church for like a month and say, this isn't working. There's sometimes he'd try to stay at a town, and they'd run him out of town. And there are some places he would sit, and he would be there for a long time. And Paul had to figure out how to make this decision. Is this a time to buckle down? Is this a time to bail? And that's what he is telling Timothy, right? You need to learn when it's time to buckle down. It's time now. You have a church in front of you. That church needs you. Get to it. Right? So, that, that's the, the word to, to Timothy. Right? There'll be time to get up and move, up, move along. This isn't it. And then he goes on to explain, and you know why it is that you need to stay there. We have these folks who are getting distracted by things that are novel and new, getting caught up with myths and uh, speculating about genealogy. Instead of sticking to the basics, they're getting excited about everything else. And to these, Paul reminds Timothy of the, the, the message to him being, get back to Jesus, right? Stop wandering, just stop, need to refocus folks, know Christ and him crucified, and let the rest be the rest. Paul wants to pound home the importance on focusing on Jesus and not getting caught up in all that seems interesting in the moments. And, and so what he does is he gives Paul this list of all the temptations. Like, if you, you stop being grounded in, in Jesus and, and the basics, study of scripture, prayers, worship together, service. If you stop being grounded in that, look what could happen. And he gives a long list of all the ways people can go astray. And we don't particularly need to hash through that list right now. But it makes it clear yet again that Paul has a very low view of what we can accomplish in ourselves by ourselves. And has a very high view of what God can do in us if we accept it. And so he's reminding Timothy, like, you need to take the leadership of this church. 
Keep them focused. Don't let them get distracted. Keep them on task. Keep them focused, following Jesus and what the practicality is, the basics of what that is. And he reminds them, and part of that is understanding the law properly. We all know the law is good. We need to keep on helping them understand that. And the way that he, understand, he explains the law is what I think of as the dishwasher theory of law. Let me explain the dishwasher theory of law. There was a law in my household growing up about the dishwasher. Here is that law, the thou shalt of the Kuhn family. If you open the dishwasher and it, was, it, it had run and cleaned the dishes, the first one to open the dishwasher after it had run, thou shalt empty thine dishwasher. And so what happened was in the morning when you wanted to get some cereal and the bowls were all, there were no bowls up there, you would go and you'd start to open the dishwasher and you'd realize it was clean. So you'd want to like wash one, but you'd see, realize it was clean, the steam would puff out and you would close it really quick and say, well, I'll just have my cereal in a bug and hope your mama hadn't seen you. And she had, and you were doomed every time. I never got away with that, right? And that was the law of the dishwasher. And then I grew up, right? And now people seem to think I know what I'm doing. But I grew up and now I have my own house. And um, does anyone check on whether I've unloaded the dishwasher? Like, have you ever come up to me and said, Andy, have you unloaded your dishwasher? No, right? Does the dishwasher still need to be unloaded? Yeah. Right? That's how the law works. We have the Ten Commandments. You know what we teach our kids? Teach them Ten Commandments. So yet, got to follow the Ten Commandments. Don't steal. Don't, don't lie. Don't murder. I hope we don't have to deal with that with small children, but don't murder. Right? Honor thy mother and father. Here are the Ten Commandments. Follow them. And, and then children grow up and they decide, they come to a realization of who they are, that we all fall short of the glory of God. We, we can choose to follow Jesus and accept forgiveness. And, and then we have a life of ahead of us of hoping to make Jesus smile and how we receive his gifts and use them. And you know what's still pretty useful? Ten Commandments. Right? You follow Jesus and now do you have to follow the Ten Commandments? Nah. Are they useful? Yup. Just like unloading the dishwasher. No one forces me to, but I do it. Right? So Paul reminds them, like, you have to teach, if you're not going to teach this church the law of the dishwasher, that's not what he calls it, but that's what it is. Uh, who is? Like, you've got to keep them understanding this. Keep this leadership focused. Right? See how, how that works. So... Paul then keeps on going, right? You, Timothy, you got to buckle down and stay at it. This is your job. This is what you got to understand and go take a swing at now. And you someone only got to keep these leaders focused on what matters, what's important, not let them get astray and start wandering, right? You can't... You all remember the prayer of Jabez for a few years ago? Do you all remember that? A few years ago, someone took one verse out of Second Chronicles or something like that and wrote a whole book. Well, there's a single reference to a dude named Jabez in the Old Testament. He preached a one-sentence prayer, and someone took that whole that, that one sentence and made a whole book out of it. And that's an example of the distractions Paul is talking about. You can get upset or uptight about one single verse buried in the Old Testament. If you want to learn how to pray, look at Jesus, who said, who the disciples come to him saying, teach us how to pray, and we get the Lord's Prayer, right? You need to be focused on what Jesus is teaching. And, and so, after covering that, Paul then says, now let's not forget who I am, Paul. Don't forget that I started out as somewhat of a wingnut, right? I was there holding the coats while everyone stoned Stephen. I started out rather confused and people gave me a chance when I, after Jesus uh, smacked me upside the back of the head, knocked me off a horse, blinded me, right? That's what Paul is getting at. After I had, had accepted I needed to follow Jesus, people gave me a chance to lead and to make a difference. And the people that you're leading there in Ephesus, Timothy, give them a chance to. You might be frustrated with them. I'm sure people were frustrated with me. That's okay. Give them a chance. God can work through them just as much as God worked through me. And then there's the first, fourth person in this little drama of the first chapter. We've had Timothy, the people who are getting distracted. We have Paul. And then we have Hymenaeus and Alexander. And this is where Paul says, uh, and don't forget, like, this is why we have to stay focused. Because it can get really ugly 
like happened with, you know, that communist and Alexander in incident? We had to ask them to leave. Wasn't that a shame? What would it take for us to ask someone to leave the church? I don't know. I don't want to find out. Let's stay focused on Jesus and acknowledge that it is possible for someone to be so disruptive that we might have to ask them to leave. I can't imagine what it would look like. Okay? So that, that, that's how Paul sort of wraps up. If you look confused, that's right. I, I can't imagine it either. Let's not find out. So, we have four actors in this, this first chapter. And looking at each of them, they each have their own lesson to be learned. For, for uh, Timothy, let the lesson around the importance of buckling down. Don't be hasty. Sit down and work at what you have in front of you. And this is a lesson that I've had to learn myself. I, I was in seminary uh, doing an internship as a youth pastor at Gethsemane United Methodist Church. And I'd spent a year there. And, and I could choose to stay or I could choose to ask to go somewhere else. And I had not approached youth, this is my first time doing youth ministry at all. I had a group of like eight very sarcastic high schoolers. <laughs> and I had taken an approach that just hadn't worked out all that well. And I wanted to go to another church and, and try to do it right this time. And I'll get it right this time. And, and my mentor, Pat Dixon, Reverend Pat Dixon, sat down with me, son, she didn't actually say that, but that's kind of the tone, just like Paul is saying to Timothy, Andy, you need to learn how to make a course correction in the middle of an appointment, because that's the temptation in Methodism, to say, well, I'll just get it right at the next church. And Andy, you need to learn how to get it right at this church, even if you have to change directions in the middle of it. So I stayed. Right? Sometimes you just got to buckle down with what's in front of you. And just get back to it. It might not be what you wanted to do, but it's what you need to do. So do it. Not a bad lesson for some, some of us to learn. It was a very good lesson for Andy to learn. You can look at the people who were distracted. The people who, like, the basics of following Jesus. Read your Bible, pray, come to worship, go out and serve. Like, that's the basics, right? I can't tell you how many times I've written a sermon that involves those as the punchline. Like, I will get to the end of the sermon and I'll start to think, like, how, why does this matter? You know why it matters? Because we need to, oh, wait a minute, pray, read the Bible, worship together, and go out and serve. And how many times have I said that? And you know what? It's true. It's true every time I say it. It's true any time anyone says it. And there are things that we think, well, there, maybe there are other ways to do this. Well, you know what? Th this is it. The pray, read the Bible, worship, and serve. That's what we got, right? That maybe that's the lesson for, for you for this day. The, don't get distracted. Stick to the basics. It will fill us up and just, it will bring us joy. And, and it has this is a purpose for the rest of our lives. Maybe the punchline for you is around Paul. Paul is the one who says, don't give up on me. Don't, don't give up on others. God didn't give up on me. And maybe that's what we need to hear. Right? Don't give up on folks. Don't really know the punchline about the last two, Hymenaeus and Alexander. Like, there are limits to what a community can accept. Let's not find them. The theme to all of these is that when it comes to church, how we gather together is this idea of responsible grace. You have each been given gifts and skills and talents, and they are amazing. It is, it is grace and gift that you have been given them, and then how we use them is our response, it's our thank you to, to God for having, having been given these gifts. Whether we are leading in the church or following or work, whatever role we're playing in the church, we have been given grace, we have been given, we have been graced these great gifts. And so for us to stay focused on Jesus, on the basics, on the, and the good news is that God has given us what we need so that we can thrive as a church. We can thrive doing his will. We can thrive here if we take what we have been given and use it well. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand and join with me as we confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed.